uh, pastor asked me today to teach from Romans chapter 2. He's, he's walking us uh, through the book of Romans, uh, and uh, I believe you all did Romans 1 and part of Romans 2, but he asked me uh, because of the break with the convention to just do all of chapter 2. So some of you, uh, this will be a review. For some of us, it will be uh, our first time. And just as a general uh, overview, in uh, chapters 1 through 3 of this book of Romans, Paul is building the case for why we must be justified by faith in Jesus Christ in order to stand righteous before God. Now, in chapter 2, he's going to argue further, uh, but he's not arguing for salvation by works. And I'm saying this up front uh, because when we examine chapter 2, it's going to appear that Paul is saying that we can save ourselves by our works. But he's really doing is establishing in chapters 1, 2, and 3 the case for why all of us need Jesus Christ and his grace in order for us to stand righteous before God. And so I don't want you to get thrown off as we walk through chapter 2 that this is not a salvation by works, but Paul is building his argument that all have sinned and come short of God's righteous standard of absolute holiness. And so in chapter 1, verses 18 through 32, uh, Paul argued that the religiously and morally hostile are condemned. We learned that the wrath of God is presently being shown to those who live as if there is no God. They took uh, the things that God created, and instead of worshiping the creator, Paul says that they worship the creature. He Paul says, we took our bodies, or they took their bodies, and they did things that were unseemly, that uh, mankind slept with mankind and even slept with animals. And so Paul is painting this picture of the depravity of humanity uh, in chapter number one, so much so that God's wrath is presently, that's a present tense verb, being revealed unto us. Now, the wrath of God is God's divine punishment based upon his angry judgment against those who sin against him or their fellow man. And so God is angry at his creation because his creation is living as if God does not exist. They are openly hostile toward God, morally uh, and religiously. Now in chapter 2, Paul is making the moral case and the religious case against those whom he deems as hypocrites. And so now he's taking his attention away from those who are morally and religiously hostile, and he's fo fo focusing his attention on those who are morally and religiously hypocrites. Uh, to make his case to the moral and religious hypocrites, the IVP background commentary notes that Paul engages in a lively diatribe style a style used by ancient philosophers challenging an imaginary opponent and thereby demolishing possible objections to his position in a vivid manner. And so as we unpack chapter 2, uh, you have to remember that Paul has dual citizenship. Uh, he is a Jew, but he is also a Roman. And so he understands all of the customs and traditions of the Jewish people and as a Roman, he understands Greek philosophy. And so he's going to argue from a Greek philosophical position using this uh, technique to argue against somebody that does not exist. He is anticipating people's objections and then arguing against the objections of imaginary people. And so I think that sets our context here for uh, chapter 2. And so we see then that in verses 1 through 16 of chapter 2, and this is the broader landscape, that the moral hypocrite is condemned. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 16, the moral hypocrite is condemned. And then the first subsection of the condemnation of the moral hypocrite is that judgment upon hypocrites who condemn others. And so Paul now 
is about to lay into these people who are moral individuals, not like the folk we just read in chapter one, but they have morals, they have some type of standard. And so Paul is about to argue against them. And in verses one through three, uh, we see that the hypocrite will not escape the judgment of God. Let's begin at verse one of chapter two in the epistle to the Romans. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, Whosoever thou art that judges, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of of God. Now, verse 1 begins with the first word, therefore. Therefore, pack points back to chapter 1, verse 32. If you take a look at that, where Paul speaks about the religiously and morally hostile who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And the point is, is that those who are morally and religiously hostile toward God understand that they are in open rebellion against God, but they choose to live their life in sin anyway. So they know what is required of them, but they refuse to live according to what's required, and they also to add insult to injury, take pleasure in people who join in open rebellion against God. And so if the, those who are morally and religiously hostile toward God know what's expected of them, Paul's therefore is targeting those who have morals. If they know what God expects and you call yourself moral, you are without excuse. This is the argument he's setting up. The moral hypocrite is quick to judge the practices of others and thinks that God will not judge them for doing the same things. See, the moral hypocrite always sees what's wrong with everybody else. Always poking his or her nose in everybody else's business and complaining about what everybody else isn't doing. Uh, but the problem with the moral hypocrite is that they're doing the same thing they're accusing everybody else of doing. Uh, you work with them, you know, they, they come in late every day, but the minute you are 30 seconds late, they want to write you up. Uh, but they come in 30 minutes late. They take extra time on their lunches and on their breaks. But anytime anybody else does something that breaks the rules, they're the first to make a complaint, the first to be ready to write them up. And so Paul is saying that how can you be pointing your finger at these folk who worship creatures who are sleeping with animals and joining an open rebellion against God when you are doing the same thing yourself? To judge here, because Paul repeats it several times, is to decide a person to be guilty and liable to punishment. So it's just not noticing and, and accusing someone of wrongdoing, but it's also calling for their punishment. That, that this, this moralist is so offended by other people's actions that they demand justice. You know, they want justice uh, when they are not the person who is at fault. You know, it is, it's like this individual I know who texts in his car, but the minute he sees somebody else texting on the road, he wishes the police uh, would, 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 would be around the corner and give them a ticket. But, but every time he's texting, he don't worry about the police serving justice. And so that's what the moral hypocrite does. He's always judging, always looking for someone to pay uh, the penalty. Uh, but, but Paul uses here, when he talks about the judgment of God, a different Greek word. When, when he talks about the moralist, he uses this Greek word, krino. But when he talks about the judgment of God, he uses a totally different word, krima. And because the judgment of God 
uh, uh, separates him from the judgment of the moralist and that God stands as the eternal and ultimate judge. One person is making a judgment, but he does not stand as judge. God is judge. He is the supreme judge. All courts, all justices answer to him. And so Paul is saying just because you're going around pointing out people's faults and failures and pronouncing judgment on them, don't you think that you're going to escape the judgment of the supreme judge himself, uh, the Lord God? So in verses 4 and 5 then, Paul uh, points out that this hypocrite stores up wrath in the day of God's judgment. Let's look at verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, talking about God, and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath, and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Uh, the moral hypocrite takes God's patient kindness for granted and is actually accumulating more wrath in a day of God's outpouring of wrath. Uh, see, what happens is, is that the person who is a moral hypocrite thinks that because God has not yet judged them that they're getting away with their own faults and failures. But what Paul is arguing is that God is patient. He is kind. Uh, the apostle uh, Peter said that God doesn't want anybody to perish, but that all might come to repentance. So God gives us adequate and ample time to change our lifestyle. But God keeps a ledger uh, because sin is a debt that is owed to God. Anytime I sin, I have created a debt that I owe to God. In the Old Testament, that debt was paid with the life of an animal. In the New Testament, that debt is paid by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so if I'm continuing to sin while judging others, and God is patiently waiting for me to change my life, God is constantly adding to his sin ledger accounts of debt that increases the level of his wrath. Because a day is coming when God's going to judge the ungodly. And the longer my sins, the greater my punishment. And so because I'm judging and busy in everybody else's business and not focusing on my own transformation and my own spiritual walk, all I'm doing is making it worse on myself. And so instead of focusing on what's wrong with you, God is saying I need to be focused on what's wrong with me so that when I stand before his presence, I can stand holy and righteous before God. Now, Robert Mounts in the New American Commentary comments that the day of wrath refers to the end time when God will reward righteousness and punish wickedness, end quote. So the day of wrath not only is the day when God rewards people for the evil that they have done, but it's also a day of judgment when God will reward us for the good that we have done. And, and this is why I prefaced in the beginning that Paul is not arguing for salvation by works. He's making an argument against why all have sinned and that nobody can work their way to heaven, all right? I don't want to spoil the show for you because Paul's argument is very logical and strategic and systemic, but I don't want people to get confused and tell the pastor I'm teaching salvation by works. But, but, but Paul is using Greek philosophy to communicate to the people in Rome his reason why nobody can earn their way into heaven. And so he's building this case and this argument. And so that takes our first subsection. In the next subsection, verses 6 through 11, judgment upon everyone according to each person's works. So there's judgment in 1 through 5 upon the hypocrites who condemn others. Now it's judgment upon everyone according to each person's works. And the first point Paul makes in this section is that God's judgment is based upon what each person deserves. Let's look at verse 6, Romans chapter 2. 
God, the relative pronoun who points back to God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. So God will repay everyone according to their works. Whatever you do, good or evil, God's going to repay us for it. And so we earn our reward. When we deal in the economy of God, we earn the reward that we receive. And we even know uh, now thinking about being in Christ Jesus that Paul tells us in his letter to the Corinthians that even we who are saved will be judged for the works we do in this body. We will not be judged as to whether or not we will go into heaven or hell, but we will be judged whether or not we receive reward or loss. And so although we are saved, let's not get it in our minds that I'm scot-free and I can kick up my heels and sip on lemonade. No, now God has saved me to do the work of the kingdom, and so he's going to reward me or take from me based upon what I do now that I'm saved. And so Paul says here to the Romans that uh, God is going to judge us according to our works. Good reward for good works, punishment for evil works. Uh, now, this verse 6 is a quote from Psalm 6212. Most of your Bibles, if they're half decent, will have some type of uh, note there that points to Psalm 6212, where David is encouraging us to trust in God's deliverance and not to turn to oppression and robbery because God will repay everyone for their actions. Now, in Psalm 62, David is having a hard time. He's facing affliction, and he's stuck with two choices. Does he revert to his flesh and do what he wants to do to get out of the situation, or does he patiently wait on the Lord for his deliverance and his salvation? And so on one hand, David says, don't commit robbery, don't oppress others, because that is not God's will for us in our trials and tribulations. Oftentimes, when we're going through, we want God to pull us out, not understanding that God uses the furnace of affliction in order to develop spiritual maturity in us, because we are in a relationship with God. And even though we expect God to do everything with us, a relationship means that I have to do something for the other party. It can't just be me receiving and taking from God, but there is an expectation that I give back to God. And the way I give back to God is by staying in my trial, maintaining my composure in the midst of adversity, and not going back to the way I would have did stuff 10 years ago, but I'm going to live like I know the God of my salvation because he will ultimately deliver me and bring me out. Verses 7 and 8, Paul goes on uh, to explain that God's judgment is based upon the perspective which with, with which one lives. Verse 7, he says to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor in immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. Now, he's, he's pulling from his argument that God is going to reward everybody for their deeds. So he's making this delineation, this juxtaposition. There is eternal life on one hand. There is indignation and wrath on the other hand. And it's based upon the perspective with which I live my life that will determine whether I get the eternal life or the indignation and wrath. As David lays out in Psalm 62, we can either patiently wait on the Lord's deliverance by living in obedience to God's will for our lives or we can be selfishly ambitious. That's that word in your King James Version, contentious. It is translated in the New American Standard Bible and others, selfish ambition. We can be selfishly ambitious by living in disobedience to God's will. The obedient will be repaid with eternal life, but the disobedient will be repaid with the indignation and wrath of God. 
So here's the point. When I'm going through my trials, if I revert to the way I want to do things, it is out of the perspective and motive of selfishness. Because I don't want to suffer for God. I don't want to have affliction and difficulty for God. I want him to put a BMW in the front of my house. I want him to pay all of my bills. I want him to take me to the mag mile and buy me the finest clothes that God just becomes my sugar daddy. That's, that's all he's there for is for me to rub the magic bottle and God pop out and say, give me the desires of your heart. But that's not Christianity. That's not the message of the cross. That's not the message of suffering with him in order that we might reign with him. Because if they killed a green tree, what are they going to do to us rotten little scandrels, right? And so if, if, if we're going to walk this Christian life and all of us must suffer tribulation, the perspective with which I go through my challenge will determine my reward. If I want to bail out, because I can't take this. It, it, God ain't showed up. He's supposed to be here three days ago. It's been three months. I'm out of here. I'm going back to the streets. I'm, I'm going back to my former life. I'm going to move in with that man that's been asking me to move in with him. I'm going to cheat on this ledger because I have things I need and things I need to do. And God hasn't delivered and showed up in the way I expected him to do. So something must be regard, wrong with God. And I'm going to engage in selfish ambition. Verses 9 through 11, Paul tells us that God's judgment is based upon the lifestyle one lives, not pedigree. Verse 9 of chapter 2. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile, but glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. Every person will be rewarded for their deeds irrespective of their religious background. The disobedient will suffer and the obedient will celebrate. Now it's important to understand that in the Bible there are two groups of people. There are Jews and they are Gentiles. If you are not a Jew, you are a Gentile. This is how God separates the economy of mankind. Jewish people are special because they have been chosen by God to be his prized possession. He did not choose the other nations of the earth. Therefore, they fall in the category of Gentile. And so when he speaks of the Jewish people, he is speaking of his chosen people. The Gentiles are those of us uh, who are not Jews that have not been chosen by God. Now, it's important that Paul lays this out because he's saying that God does not respect who you are. If you are a Jew first, because the revelation of God was given to the Jews, and we'll deal with that in a moment, but even if you did not receive the revelation of God through the law of Moses, he still will give you the same level of respect that he gives his chosen people because he's looking at our works. This is Paul's argument, and we're going to unpack it further in a second. And so if God judges every man, good or evil, right or wrong, based upon his works, male or female, black or white, rich or poor, educated or uneducated, Jew or Gentile, that God looks beyond all of that. And he says, show me your works. Show me how you've lived righteously before me. And if you have not done so, then you will suffer as a result of your obstinance uh, against me. And then the final subsection of the moral hypocrite is in verses 12 through 16. There is judgment upon everyone according to each person's moral code. So now watch how Paul develops this. He says, judgment upon the hypocrites who condemn others, one through five. First of all, I got to expose to you that you got a log in your own eye. 
Then Paul moves his argument to judgment upon everyone according to their works. Now he moves against this hypocrite judgment upon everyone according to each person's moral code. So Paul is laying his case. He's a lawyer. He's a, a Pharisee. He's trained in the law. He's tra trained in uh, Greek rhetoric. He has everything at his, at his disposal. And he's laying into these folk who think they can escape the wrath and judgment of God. So in verses 12 through 13, Paul now argues that Gentiles will not be judged by the law of Moses. So look at verse 12. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. So now the Gentiles who were not given the law of Moses are not responsible for living according to it. Therefore, they will not be judged by the requirement of the law. Now, this is important, right? Because remember, Paul is using a diatribe, which means he is arguing against an imaginary opponent. He's arguing against the people in the church in Rome who he cannot see. He's never visited Rome before. This is the reason he is writing this letter in anticipation that he will have fellowship with them to talk about the gospel. But until Paul arrives in Rome, he sends this letter ahead of him to give them a full and proper understanding of this gospel of Jesus Christ to now which they believe. And so Paul anticipates in his mind, if you're telling me that God's going to judge everybody by their works, how is God fair? You just told me he is no respecter of persons, that if I do good, he's going to judge me. If I do evil, he's going to judge me. So how can a fair and righteous God judge the Gentiles who do not have the law of Moses? And Paul's response is, is those people who do not have the law of Moses will not be judged by the law of Moses. They're going to be judged by a different criteria. He's going to lay this out in a moment. But his point is, I know what you're thinking. I know where you're going. And so before you get stuck on, stuck on the law of Moses, I am not going to be judged by the law of Moses if I am a Gentile. Because the law was given to the Jewish people by Moses at Mount Sinai. If we all remember that as in Exodus, that the law of Moses was given to the chosen people of God, the Jewish people, and it was their requirement to obey the law of Moses. Now, the Jews were given the law of Moses and are responsible for living according to it. Therefore, they will be judged by whether or not they fulfill all its requirements. And so while God is not going to judge Gentiles by the law of Moses, the Jews are required to keep it. Not some of it, not part of it, but all of it. There is no 99.9% .9 success rate when it comes to the law of Moses. If you sin one time, the Bible says you are guilty and worthy of death one time and because this is a covenant the law of Moses is a covenant when Moses gave them the law and you can read it it's in the Bible they said all that the Lord have commanded we will obey and do all not most of not part of not some of but all that the Lord have commanded we will obey and do that's their signing of their name on the covenant with God. Their verbal and audible signature that God and us are now in covenant. And so once they said we will obey and do everything that the law requires, they are held liable to all of the laws that Moses laid out. And so they will be judged as to whether or not they kept it. So just because the Jews knew God's revealed truth, 
and it did not automatically make them righteous in God's sight. It is living in obedience to God's truth that makes one righteous. Because Paul is deconstructing their argument. Just because they received the revealed truth of God did not mean they were automatically righteous. Just because we have a Bible in our hands doesn't make us righteous. There may be this persona that we're righteous, but carrying a Bible does not make you righteous. It is the living according to what the Bible commands that makes us righteous before God. And when we say righteous, that means that I am in right standing before God, that God and I are straight, that we are on a friendly basis so that when I stand before him, he will not strike me down dead because of the sin in my life. But I stand before him righteous because the blood of Jesus covers me and permits me to stand in the presence of an ethically and, uh, and justly moral God who is holy inside and out. And so it's important because the word of God is the mind of God. And I want you to appreciate what you hold in your hand. What you hold in your hand is the mind of God. It is God's mind. It is God's thoughts. It is not the totality or the completion of God's thought. It is just a little speck of saying of God's thoughts. But if you ever wanted to know what God is thinking, you have it right before you in the word of God. And sometimes we fail to recognize the magnitude of our giftedness in having access to God's mind. I don't, I don't have to go to the preacher. I don't have to come to the church to find out what God is thinking. I don't have to give a thousand dollar C to some teller evangelist to tell me what God is thinking about me. Because he has already told me that he knows the thoughts he thinks toward me, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give me a future and a hope. And so if I ever take the time to get God's mind in my mind, I'll start thinking like God. But the reason I don't live like God is because I don't think like God. And the reason I don't think like God, because I'm not reading the thoughts that God has already shared with me. And so because then the Jews had God's mind, they just thought they were automatically righteous. But Paul has to bust their bubble and let them know that it is obedience to God's truth that makes one righteous. In verses 14 through 16, the Gentiles then will be judged by their internal moral code. Verse 14, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel." So although the Gentiles were not given the law of Moses, there are some who live consistent with its requirements because of a natural moral code internally implanted. This internal moral code is attested to by the human conscience. So what Paul is saying, when Gentiles who have never received the law of Moses do the things required in the law, there has to be something else at work. On the inside of them and what he is arguing then is not for a God gene and like Time magazine had several years ago but he is arguing that inside of all humanity is an internal moral code that there is something in us that we know right from wrong we may not fully understand how God works and operates but we understand stealing is wrong I don't care what culture you live in, what nationality you are, stealing is wrong. Killing innocent people is wrong. Lying is wrong. So if you know these things are wrong and you have not received the law, then how did you know it? God put it inside of us. And then Paul says that not only does God put this internal moral code inside of us, 
but our own conscience bears witness that there's something moral on the inside of us. Now, when we looked at uh, chapter 1, verses 18 through 32, we saw at verse 32 that they knew they were sinning against God, right? That's why Paul puts that there. God, Paul is very intentional. He builds his case very methodically. And so he's already established that people who live in open hostility and rebellion against God know they're rebelling. They just override their moral conscience. And so they are without excuse, as well as the person who has some level of morality. And so my conscience then is not my moral code but it is a witness that there was something moral that guides my behavior, even if not, I want to acknowledge it. And so what Paul is saying then is that God's not going to judge Gentiles who have never read the law of Moses by the law of Moses. He's going to judge them by their own internal moral code. So God is not unfair. God is not unjust. So those people, uh, because what about the gospel? Let's broaden it out to its wider uh, context. The people who have never heard the gospel, right? That's one of the questions people always ask. What about the people who have never heard the gospel in the jungles and the far back woods of places that missionaries have not yet reached? They won't be judged by the gospel of Jesus Christ. They will be judged by whether or not they listen to their own internal moral code. So God is not unfair. He's not going to send them to hell for rejecting Jesus. He's going to send them to hell for rejecting the internal moral code that said, don't steal, don't kill, don't lie. Even our little kids, and I'm not talking about four and five, but little two-year-olds know when they did wrong. Did you give them the law of Moses? Did you give them the Bible and, and lay out for them? Let him who stole steal no more. It is something internal that God has placed inside of us so that we cannot argue that God is unfair. Uh, the conscience then is the inward faculty of distinguishing right and wrong. So there's something in the side of me that lets me know right and wrong and then my conscience is the faculty or the instrument that highlights that rightness or wrongness. Uh, Everett F. Harrison in the Expositor's Bible Commentary cites C.A. Pierce who writes that the everyday language of the Gentiles contains a word for confessing to feelings of pain on commission or initiation of particular acts, feelings which carry with them the conviction that the acts ought not to have been committed is firsthand evidence that the Gentiles are subject by nature to a natural law as the Jews by vocation to the Torah, end quote. So he is equating that internal natural moral code of the Gentiles to the written moral code of the law. They are equal. They are on par. And so God will through Jesus Christ, judge Gentiles, not by the law of Moses, but by the internal moral code attested to by our conscience. And so that concludes then, verses 1 through 16, concludes Paul's argument against the moral hypocrite, this person who was judging everybody else for the faults they had and overlooking their own faults. Now he's about to move to the religious hypocrite in the person of the Jewish people. Now, he's speaking to the Jews, but we're broadening out this argument to religious hypocrites uh, in general. He introduced them into the conversation when he said that we have to be obedient and will be judged by our works to the Jew first and the Gentile, or we'll be punished to the Jew first or the Gentile. So he's introduced them into the conversation now in the remainder of chapter 2 and then all of chapter 3, Paul is going to go hard at the Jewish people. And so uh, in 2.17 through 24, uh, Paul deals uh, with the righteous based upon what you do and not what you know. So righteousness, right standing before God is based upon what you do, not what you, what you know.
In that first subsection, verses 17 through 20, Paul says that the Jews considered themselves superior because they were given the revelation of God's truth. Let's look at verse 17. Behold, thou art called a Jew and restest in the law, makest thy boast of God and knowest his will and approvest the things that are more excellent being instructed out of the law and are confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. So the Jews, as I said earlier, were chosen to be God's special possession out of all the nations of the earth. This special status, instead of making them humble, made them proud and arrogant. See, it is one thing to understand that you are saved by grace and grace alone. It is another thing to think that God needed you and that somehow you added some benefit to God. And so God is very clear to the Jewish people when he deals with them in Deuteronomy. And he says to them, I did not choose you because you were the strongest. They were not the strongest nation. He tells them, I didn't choose you because you were more in number. They were not the most numerous people. But he chose them for one reason and one reason only, love. Love. And so as our pastor has been trying to prepare us, as the demographics of our church change, and as the outreach of our church continues, we can't be so high and mighty that we think we're better than the folk who are coming in here that don't always dress like we dress and drive what we drive. Because Paul in 1 Corinthians tells us that God chooses the weak and foolish things of the world to confound the wise. There is a high probability that God chose you because you were nothing. He, he, he chooses us so that he can be the potter and we can be the clay. And when God gets through with us, people can say, is this not marvelous in our eyes? That, that God could take a crackhead and now make them the CEO of a corporation. That he could take a prostitute and turn them uh, into an evangelist. That he could take a gangbanger and make them a leader over men's ministry. It is the favor of God. And the grace of God in our lives that helps us understand we are not high and mighty in and of ourselves. But it's because God loved us that he looked beyond our faults. He saw our needs. He saw that we were struggling. He told the children of Israel that they were like a little a failed aborted baby on the side of the road, waddling in his own blood. But he came in and scooped them up cleaned them off, fixed them up, and gave them the prized possession of being his soul people. And that's what God did with us. He, he found us somewhere. I don't know where he found you, but he found you somewhere. Doing what you shouldn't have been doing. Hanging with which, who you shouldn't have been hanging with. But he loved you enough to draw you with love and kindness. Touch your neighbor and say, don't get the big head. Get the big head. We, 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 we get carried away now. We got $1,000 suits and red bottom shoes and can't nobody tell us nothing. Oh, praise the Lord. It's 70 degrees and you got your fur coat on. You know, all the... Nobody want to see all that. What that lady say, ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> and so they were given... The revelation of God's will and considered themselves, watch this, instructors of the foolish and teachers of infants. See, Paul is mark mocking them when he says in verse 20 that you are an instructor of the foolish. 
a teacher of babes. He, this is their view of Gentiles, that, that they were so high and mighty that they were arrogant, that they considered the Jews dogs. And so Paul is saying, here you are, Mr. and Mrs. High and Mighty. Now you, you know John 3.16, and now you, uh, you, you the baddest person uh, in, in, in theology, that, that nobody's good enough for you now. Paul is saying, slow down, just, just take, a, take a chill pill because God's grace and mercy uh, is the only reason you're in a position that you are in uh, right now. And, and so we have to be careful. We have to be careful because people are watching us. Uh, they say that we live in a post-Christian America now, that, that uh, we see the open hostility toward Christians. We see that any and everything they can do to stop us from expressing our faith, I, I believe pretty soon, in America that Christians will become a protected class just because of the open hostility uh, legally and financially and all that's going on. And so we have to make sure that we are humble servants. We have to make sure that we don't raise up in pride, but that our sufficiency and our dependency is in Christ and not in ourselves. So that's what Paul is telling them there in 17 to 20. In verses 21 to 24, he tells the Jews that they were bringing reproach upon God's name because of their hypocrisy. Verse 21, thou therefore which teacheth another, teachest not thou thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, does thou steal? Thou sayest a man should not commit adultery, does thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, does thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law dishonorest thou God, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. Despite the Jews having the revealed truth of God's will, like the moralists, they were living hypocritically. They preached to the foolish and infant Gentiles not to steal, not to commit adultery, not to engage in idolatry, but they themselves were stealing, committing adultery, and robbing pagan temples of their idols. So the very thing that these high and mighty folk who are teaching the foolish and who are teaching these infants were breaking their own preaching, breaking uh, their own teaching. Uh, isn't it something how church folk can preach and teach to everybody, but their lives are all jacked up. <laughs> because of your hypocrisy, you are bringing dishonor on the name of the Lord. I, I can't tell you the number of times I've heard about Christians on jobs who are a complete embarrassment to the cause of Christ. You better off not even saying you are a Christian. Because folk look at you and wonder if that's Christianity, then I'm straight. I'm, I'm, I'm all right because you cuss with everybody else who cussing. You don't do the job you're supposed to do. Uh, you, you don't set an example as to what Christianity is. And so Paul is saying that you Jewish or you religious folk, because of your hypocrisy, you set a bad, a bad example. You're blaspheming the name of of the Lord. Verse 24 there, Paul is quoting from Isaiah 52 5. Again, your footnote will tell you that, where Isaiah is prophesying to those who have been taken captive because of the rebellion of Israel and Judah. Their captives constantly taunted them and slandered the name of the Lord because he did not prevent them from taking Israel and Judah captive. Now, what happens is, if you have to understand, in that day and age, we understand that God is the only true and living God. The nations of the earth thought that they had God's small g that operated on their behalf. So when a nation conquered another nation, it was that my God defeated the God of your nation. So when Israel was taken captivity by Assyria, and Judah was taken captivity by Babylon, it was as if God had been defeated. And so they taunted the children of Israel 
and they mocked God because in their eyes, God had been defeated. Now, they didn't understand that the reason Israel and Judah were in captivity is because they disobeyed his commandments. And he warned them repeatedly through all of the prophets, either you turn from your wicked ways or I'm going to send you to a far and distant land where you will be taken captive. They, they didn't heed his warning. No, oh, God's merciful. He ain't going to do nothing. And then here comes Assyria taking away Israel. Then, uh, years later, Judah saw what happened to Israel. All oh, with Judah, we got the temple here. We got the Ark of the Covenant here. God would never let anything happen. And he sends Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, destroys the house of God, breaks down the walls of God's chosen city, Zion, and takes his people captive. Even the children of Israel, one of the Psalms say, how can we sing the songs of God in a foreign land? How can we praise God in a land where we're foreigners and they're asking us to play songs? They want us to sing church songs in the land of our enemy. How can we do that? And so when we're on our jobs, we have to be careful that we represent Christ well because God's name is is online his reputation is at stake it's not about what people think so much of you as it is the God that you say you represent because we're the ones that are broadcasting to everybody that we are Christian but we got a wife and a girlfriend at the job right we sleeping with all of the men on the job we lying on reports. And God's name is blasphemed. 21, 5 through 29, we see, and this is Paul's conclusion, that righteousness is based upon the status of your heart and not religious symbolism. It's, it's what you do, not what you know. It's the status of your heart and not religious symbolism. 25 to 27, it is obedience and not religious symbolism that demonstrates a person's relationship with God. Verse 25, for circumcision, verily profiteth if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature... If it fulfill the law, judge thee who by the letter and circumcision doth transgress the law. So the Jews here thought that because they had the law of Moses and the physical sign of their covenant with God through circumcision of the male anatomy, that they were righteous before God. However, God is not concerned with religious symbols as he is with obedience. It is not the symbols that God is concerned with. It is obedience. So the Gentiles who were uncircumcised but obeyed the law would be considered circumcised. So if their, the foreskin of their anatomy, the men, was not cut, yet they obeyed the law, Paul is saying God considers them circumcised. So circumcision cannot be physical, cannot be symbolic. It has to be deeper. And the Jew who was circumcised but disobeyed the law would be considered uncircumcised. So one person goes through the symbolic process but is not considered having done such. The other person does not go through the symbolic process, but because of their obedience, they are considered as righteous. And so an uncircumcised Gentile who obeyed the law would be an embarrassment to the circumcised Jew who did not. Have you ever had the experience on your job or with a friend or family where you were the Christian, they were the sinner, but they did what you should have did? And so you felt guilty? Paul is not saying that Gentiles will judge Jews. 
But what he's saying is by other people's actions who are not even affiliated with all of our symbolism but do what is required, they bring shame on us. I should have did that. I knew better, but I let my flesh get in the way. I, I let my pride and my ego get in the way. I let my selfish ambition get in the way. And so now I look small, and this ungodly person looks big because I didn't honor my covenant with God. In verses 28 through 29, uh, Paul says that it is the inward transformation of the heart and not external signs that demonstrates a person's relationship with God. Verse 28, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in a letter whose praise is not of men, but of God. So now when we look at being a Jew, we have to broaden our parameter and our scope because we are now talking about those who are God's chosen people, not just those who are ethnic Jews. So now, Jew is not about your ethnicity. It's about the transformation of your heart. It is about being a chosen individual of God. So whether or not I was born in Israel, whether or not I have a Jewish name, whether or not I have a Jewish lineage, I am a Jew because Jew ultimately means to be God's chosen possession. So God's chosen people then are not determined by outward expressions of religious piety, but by the inward circumcision or transformation of the heart that lives in obedience to God's will. So Paul then is moving us. He's building his case against the hostile individual, against the moral hypocrite, and the religious hypocrite that they are all condemned. This is his point because he's going to argue, and it may have sounded confusing, as which is I gave you that preface, that Paul here is not arguing for salvation by works but he's setting a trap that when we get to 323, all have sinned and come short of God's righteous standard. And so although the hostile are condemned and the hypocrites are condemned, I'm so glad that in Romans 8, chapter uh, 8, verse 1, it says that there is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. So it don't matter what I used to be, that's in the past. Because what I was is not who I am today. I ain't no hypocrite. I ain't hostile to God. But I stand justified by the blood of the Lamb. And I'm so glad that God looked beyond my fault and he saw my need. I'm glad that he didn't leave me by the wayside, but he picked me up. He turned me around. He placed my feet on solid ground. You ought to give your neighbor high five and say, I'm not condemned. I don't know about you you but I'm so glad that I'm not condemned uh, I once was lost but now I'm fine I once was blind but now I see I might have been a sinner but now I'm somebody that's saved by grace and if it had not been for the goodness of the Lord who was on my side where would I be but I stand justified I stand righteous I stand holy I stand in the favor of God because of his goodness and his mercy and his grace somebody Everybody ought to shout hallelujah. hallelujah. 